For the last three decades, Knowledge Center at Bursa has offered technology, resources, services, space, and a sense of community. Since 1985, 14,000 titles have been collected with care and attention to high financial literacy standards. In collaboration with a global community of institutions, we ensure access to the world's diverse intellectual and cultural economic heritage, as well as fast online services for connectivity to the financial world. Serving the Bursa Malaysia community and beyond, Knowledge Center at Bursa empowers you in your trading and investment analysis research. Financial information at my fingertips. Visit Knowledge Center at Bursa Malaysia today for the collections, for the services, for the sense of community. You have suffered financial loss while investing and you think your bank, broker, fund management company, unit trust management company, PRS provider or distributor or their agent or representative is responsible. You need help sorting out the problem or want to seek redress. Where do you go? Sidrek is here to help you start the conversation and reach some resolution. First, lodge a formal complaint with a company that sold or offered you the unit trusts, shares, derivatives or other capital market product or service. But you're not happy with their response. You have 180 days from their final written reply to come to Sidrek. Or if there's no written response, and it's been 90 days since you wrote to them, you don't need to wait longer. You may come to Sidrek even though you haven't received a final response yet. Sidrek first checks the eligibility of your claim. For example, is it within Sidrek's claim limit? Is it against a member of Sidrek? And so forth. If your case is eligible, we begin the dispute resolution process. All information in this process is confidential. We get both you and the member you're complaining against to sit with us and have a conversation. Documents and information will be required from both parties. No lawyers are allowed in the mediation process as we keep the discussions informal and private. Our mediators are impartial and will hear both sides out and help parties communicate constructively towards resolving the dispute. Two outcomes are possible at this stage. Either both you and the member agree to a settlement, or you don't. If the both of you agree to a settlement, an agreement is signed and the mediation process ends successfully. But if both you and the member fail to reach a satisfactory resolution, mediation has thus failed. But don't worry, Sidrek then proceeds to the next stage, adjudication. During adjudication, parties are given the chance to provide any further information to help their case and ask each other further questions. Our adjudicator will then study and consider all facts and information provided, including the conduct of the parties, laws and best industry practices, as well as what's fair and reasonable. Sidrek's adjudicator will then make a final decision on the dispute and the monetary claim. If the decision is in your favour, it could be a full award or a partial award for your claim. But if the decision isn't in your favour, then no award will be made. You, the investor, will still have a choice. If you reject the decision, Sidrek will simply close the case and you may seek other legal avenues for redress. If you choose to accept the decision, however, the member has to comply with it. Once the parties have confirmed compliance to the decision, Sidrek will close the case. So let Sidrek help start the conversation towards resolution. For more information, visit sidrek.com.my or call 03 2282 2280. Versa Malaysia has been part of the Malaysian economic growth for over four decades. We have been working relentlessly 
to create a transparent, efficient and vibrant stock exchange. While we've been working at building a vibrant marketplace, inclusivity and contributing towards economic growth, we have also channeled efforts and resources towards supporting the community at large. Shares to Share is one such effort, which has been developed to create positive impact towards society and the environment. To put it simply, Shares to Share is a transparent and easily accessible facility that enables investors to donate their listed securities or proceeds from the sale of their listed securities towards charity through Yayas Unverse in Malaysia. You can donate odd lots or even board lots. The funds from the sale of these shares will be channeled to approved charitable organisations and their respective initiatives or projects. Bursa Malaysia has waived its portion of the transfer fee, clearing and trading fees for all transactions that are conducted under Shares to Share. The participating brokers of Shares to Share have also agreed to waive their portion of the transfer fee and brokerage. The charitable organisations that have been selected have undergone the necessary due diligence process and have been duly approved by an independent selection committee. At least half a million populations live with some kind of disability. They are most of the time being left behind. We need to empower them, otherwise they will continue to be the liability. A lot of human resources wasted from this program. We provide a lot of support for persons with disability who are young adults and adults. We have a social enterprise called Project I'm Possible where we managed to hire all persons with municipality to work here. We have a cafe, bakery, weaving, and we have an art gallery. Purity of thought, word, and deed, that is action, is very important to be really successful. We must know some skills to be able to help us then paperwork. The grant from shares to share will be used for one is sewing, handicraft, classical dance, and so on. Our patients have to be fed, they have to be looked after, we look out for any sort of disease they might develop, you know, also those unforeseen circumstances. Thanks to Bursa's initiative, we can be a little bit easy on our patients if they are. Donations will all be channeled to organizations that are involved in the sustainable development of Malaysia. The Shares to Share scheme offers you the chance to do so in a simple and effective way. Versus Shares to Share allows us to do good by donating our shares to charities. We join us in making a difference to the society by donating your listed shares. Shares to Share is open to all donors, individual as well as corporates or other types of entities. You can transfer your listed securities via Bursa Anywhere app at a click. For more information, please visit our Bursa Malaysia website. Hello everybody! Welcome to this webinar brought to you by Bursa Malaysia and managed by our company LifeCham. Today, our webinar title is The Root Map to Build a Six-Figure Portfolio from Scratch. Welcome everybody to this session. My name is Shen Chu. I'm the moderator for this webinar. Now, before we begin, as usual, our disclaimer, whatever you share in this webinar is only for educational purpose. In no way that we give any recommendation for you to buy or sell any listed securities that we mentioned here. If you decide to make any investment decisions, you're 100% responsible for all your investment risks. Now, allow me to briefly introduce our speaker today, and he's going to share with us how he built his portfolio to six figure from scratch. And he's going to share with you his approach, real case studies on how he built a portfolio to six figure. He's none other than Mr. Ian Tai. 
So Ian Tai is a content producer on kcl.com. He has written uh, more than 250 articles on kcl.com and he's also the weekly webinar host and presenter. He's also the co-founder of uh, dividendvault.com whereby he manufactures savvy investors who can build dividend-based portfolios independently. Uh, he himself is a dividend investor where he primarily invests for dividend income and raking in the yields between 2 to 9% per annum. So that's uh, Ian. So Ian, how are you today? Hello, Shane. Hello, guys. Welcome to this webinar session. Always a pleasure to be here, Shane. So do I take it away or how? Yes. Am? Yeah, it's our pleasure too, right? So you may take over the slide control. All right. Fantastic. Once again, thank you so much for your kind introduction. And it's always very, very good to be here on Versa's platform, on Live Champs platform, to actually share with you guys a little bit about my own personal story, my own journey on how I actually built my own portfolio. Okay, so I have actually prepared a lot in terms of content today. So I'll just go through the syllabus for today's webinar session. And guys, of course, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to just type in. I would love to actually address um, some really, really good questions from you guys right after this webinar session. Okay, so with that, let's continue. Okay, today we are going to talk about five things in this webinar session. The first one is that how not to start investing in stocks. The second one will be the four levels of investors in the stock market. Okay, so maybe for example, today, if you're listening to you, I'm not too sure where you are at right now when it comes to your journey in terms of uh, stock investing. So I will actually review to you what are the four levels so that you can actually uh, identify yourself. And uh, maybe from there, you can actually learn better um, learn better about yourself. And more importantly, I will actually move on to the next one, which is the actions that you need to take uh, in order to actually bring your portfolio to the next level. So let's say, for example, you're in, if let's say, for example, today you are in level one, then I will actually try, I will actually uh, hand over some pointers as to how you can actually go from level one to level two. And if you happen to be on level two, then maybe you can actually go into level three. And if you're at level three, then of course you can actually move up to level four. So that is actually the whole, uh, one of the key purposes of uh, this webinar session today. The fourth one will be, I'll be actually talking about some tipping points at each level of investing. So which means I say, let's say for example, today you are at level two. So I have actually, so I will, what I will do is that I will identify not just where you're at, if you're actually at level two, what are the actions taken? And more importantly, the tipping point means when you actually graduate from level two and actually hit level three, okay? So this will be also another talking point in this webinar session. And last but not least, I will also share why investing is easier when your portfolio hits 100K in Ringgit Malaysia. Okay, so once you hit the six-figure um, level, so investing is no longer, no longer the same. You will, actually, you will actually be living in a different world already as compared to when, um, when you are still quite new in terms of uh, stock investing, okay? So there's a different world between someone who is actually quite new to stock investing and someone who has actually built a six-figure portfolio and then uh, that kind of stuff, okay? So it's a different world and I'm going to just share with you why is it why is it so? Why is it that the world is actually different once your portfolio hits 100K and above, okay? So these are the five talking points for this webinar session. So let's go into part one how not to start investing in the stock market. Okay, so typically here, I'm, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to just share with you the typical chronology, all right, which means say this is actually what most people do or how most people start investing in stocks, okay? So I'm going to just share with you how, what is actually their mind frame, what are, what are the mind frames, what are the processes that most people will be thinking of when it comes to starting their journey as an investor in the stock market. So this is how most people start, okay? So step one. So step one normally involves capital, which means to say like, um, for example, let's say someone, if let's say someone has no money, obviously um, for most people, if they don't have money, they won't actually start thinking about where should I invest my money? So for example, if you don't have much in terms of your savings, then of course you don't think about investing, all right? That is actually quite normal. So usually what happens is that once people start 
having or receiving some form of uh, money, or maybe they have actually saved up some capital in their bank account, that is actually the time where they started to think about, oh, how, um, apart from just uh, putting my money in the bank, where and how and what should I be investing in, okay? So the first thing that got people to think about investment is when they have money. And the common question that people have is that I have certain amount of capital, let's say a hundred grand, for example, what should I invest in? So guys, just to sidetrack a little bit, typically, right, when you have capital, right, uh, just don't tell anyone that you have capital, lah, all right? Simply because when people know that you have capital, right, then they will tell you a lot of ways, a lot of methods, a lot of things that, um, that uh, you can actually invest into. All right. So there are many ideas that will be thrown at you once you have re once you review that you have capital. Okay. So usually when you have capital, just don't say much. Don't say too much. Okay. Usually, as a savvy investor, what we do is that when we have capital, we just do our own investment privately. Okay. So that is actually what we do. But um, the thing is that uh, but if you actually review review that you have a lot of capital to actually invest, then uh, a lot of people will give you a lot of ideas as to what you should be doing with your money. And what those are may not be necessarily a good idea to you, okay? So typically what got people it started to actually invest is, is when they have capital. So let's say for example, this person has capital and he's actually interested in investing in the stock market. So the next question that people will ask is this, which broker, okay, which broker? So here what, will, what people do is that they tend to actually compare the broker in terms of their brokerage fees, okay, in terms of the broker's facilities and, and whatnot. Then after that, they start to open a stock brokerage account, okay, so that is actually step number two. First step is actually on the capital. The second step is on the which broker, what broker. Okay, what broker should they use? Then after they got their stock brokerage account open, the next step is to think about what are the stocks that they are going to buy. Okay, so what stocks? Well, on Bursa Malaysia, we have approximately 900 to 1,000 stocks listed on the stock exchange in Malaysia. The question is, which one? So the thing is that in a sea, in a pool of 1,000 stocks, okay, so how do you actually filter down to the ones that they may actually buy? So usually the, the two best methods that, uh, that people use today will be are as followed. Number one, they will actually go through, they will actually talk to their trusted family, their trusted friends who are actually in either trading, speculating or investing in the stock market. They will actually seek for their advice. So that is actually the first source. The second source is actually from social media, okay? Social media, like for example, uh, it depends on what language you speak. Lah. For example, in English, you may go to YouTube, you may go to Facebook, you may go to Instagram. And if you happen to speak Mandarin, there is Xiao Hongsu for you to actually look into. Uh, there are so many uh, articles, there are so many blog posts, there are so many content that is actually being produced in order to entice you, in order to actually share their thoughts, their ideas, all right? And, uh, and so many other things that is actually related to the stock market, okay? There's so many of this kind of stuff in the stock market, which means to say there are also so many noises, lah, all right? So it really, really depends on what you like to read. It really depends on what actually got you click, then you may actually go into that kind of stock. All right, so they, we have social media, we have news, we have reportings like the Edge, uh, the Star Finance, the, the Star News Straits Times and all this kind of stuff. There's so many, there's so many sources, there's so many channels of, uh, there's so many places where you can actually uh, look into, where you can actually look for when it comes to stock investing information. Okay, so typically these are the two main sources trusted friends, trusted family members, and social media. That's where they get their stock ideas. And last but not least, after they have got their stock ideas, the question is what price? So what price, right? So since uh, 
So because they are new to stock investing, so very, ob very obvious is that uh, what people will do is that they will actually look into uh, the stock price based on the stock price chart, okay? So which means they'll go to Google Finance, Yahoo Finance, or even Bursa Malaysia to find out the, the latest stock price of that stock that they want to buy. And then from there, they make their decision. Okay, so that's actually the first way. The second way is that some people actually think that they can actually time the market. So which means say they can actually enter the market when it is reasonably low and they can sell when it is reasonably high. So which means to say they are trying to time the market. So when, they, when it comes to that, then of course, uh, they will actually dabble into technical analysis tools. There are softwares, there are charting tools available for them to actually time the market. So this is actually what most people do, all right? In a short summary of five minutes, that's what the whole, that's what most people do in the, when it comes to stock investing, okay? Now, all these things is actually perfectly rational. If let's say, for example, the person does not have a game plan, they don't necessarily have an investment principle, they may not have investing skills, and they don't really have a system or structure or process in order to actually build their own portfolio, then of course, um, whatever I show you in this slide here would be entirely rational, okay? But the thing is this, does it really, really work? Okay, so typically, when people actually do this, they start off with money, then they open a stock, bro stock brokerage account, then they buy stocks based on, their, based on uh, whatever input they get from social media, trusted friends and family members, and then they just look at stock price charts to actually determine which stock they want to buy at that point in time. The thing is that what I've actually gathered is that most of the time when people actually do that, uh, they tend to actually buy into, they have more stocks in their portfolio whereby their fundamental qualities are poorer. All right. So this is actually the first, the first characteristics of that kind of portfolio. The second one is that um, most of the time, most people actually tend to overpay for their stocks. Okay. So either they bought them at, at a very overvalued price or they buy just simply without any consideration of valuation. They buy because they are influenced or they, they believe that uh, it's, a, it's of good value, but actually they never really consider the valuation. So that, so that is actually why they may actually purchase a stock or purchase stocks at a much higher value, uh, at a much higher price. And because of that, they will have very low use when it comes to their portfolio, and they have more non-performing investments, which means they have more chances of their purchases, their stock purchases right, tend to fail. And uh, when it comes to a market downturn, usually these kind of people, they will panic and they will actually want to sell and cut loss. So these are typically the people that that uh, that this is actually typically what will happen to people who actually buy stocks based on that formula or based on that strategy. Okay, so that is actually um, part number one, whereby I have actually shared how most people actually got started in the stock market and the results they are actually getting. Okay, and the thing is that is that the way to actually start investing? The answer is not quite lah. Not so, la, all right? So if you are thinking that this is actually the way to actually start investing in the stock market, uh, I would say that it's actually better to ditch the idea through, it, through this actually mind, mindset, through this uh, mind frame into the, into the rubbish bin, all right? So because uh, typically, they don't actually generate long-lasting results. Now, with that, let's move on to part number two, the four levels of investors in the stock market. Now over here, I'm going to share with you how I actually, how I, and uh, I will also say many of the, many savvy value investors, many really, really good investors who actually got to the six, le the six figure, the seven figure level kind of investors, how they actually, what is their roadmap? What are their journey? What is actually the path that they have been taking in order for them to go from zero? to six figure, to seven figure, and even more, okay? So this is actually the path, and the path is actually summarized under four different levels. So let me review it to you right now. Okay, so we have four levels. 
starting from level number one. So level number one, okay, is about mindset. Mindset is actually the most important thing when it comes to investing, okay? Many people think that it is actually capital, but it's not really so. What is actually more important than the capital is actually the mindset, the investor's mindset. Because the investor's mindset will determine how you will actually build your portfolio over the long term. Without the mindset, everything would be much um, short term, much more ad hoc, much more random. And a lot of things are actually very dependent on emotions, which is not something that you can rely on if you want to build a six-figure, seven-figure portfolio, not just building, but sustaining it, making sure that it continues to make, making sure that it continues to grow and expand in the future. Okay. So every a lot of people think that it is capital, but it's not exactly so. What is actually more important is the mindset. So level one is about the mindset. So most people actually started, most people, especially those with the six, seven, eight figure kind of portfolio, we all start with the mindset. So the mindset here is to make sure that um, when it comes to stock investing, right? Stock investing is not so much about trading stocks. It's actually a totally a different thing. It's not about buying low and sell high. All right. If you have this idea or whereby stock investing is about buying a certain stock at one ringgit and sell it at two ringgit in the future, hopefully that the future is very soon, then uh, that's not stock investing. That is actually stock trading. Or you can say that's also speculating. That is actually not what we do. What we do as a stock investor, why is it that our portfolio can continue to grow up to six figures? It's simply because we are here as investors to accumulate shares of good businesses when they are undervalued. So the keyword here is good businesses. So therefore, level, num level number one, mindset, what is stock investing all about? Stock investing is about accumulation of good businesses. So therefore, it is called business-like investing. We approach it as a business. We are like a businessman coming into the market, which is Bursa Malaysia, to find good businesses to accumulate. So that is actually level number one. So that's the mindset. Now, with level number one, here comes level number two. Once we got the idea that, okay, stock investing is about very patient, building, accumulating shares of good businesses over the long term, okay? So the question is, how do we identify good businesses? Now, this is actually where skills come in, okay? This is where skills come in. Skills like what? The first one will be accounting skills, okay? So accounting skills simply means, you know, uh, the interpretation of uh, financial statements, which is the ability to read income statements, balance sheets, cash flow statements, all right? These three main major statements. And after you read these three major statements, you kind of like find sense you can find meaning in what all these statements are all about. Then only from there, we can actually conclude whether or not this business is worthy or not worthy to invest. Whether this business is good or not so good. So this is actually what accounting skills can give investors. That sort of advantage, okay? So the thing is that now I'm going to just pause here a bit and I just want to ask the floor over here. How many of you are actually well-versed with accounting? All right, let me say, now let's say for example, I, let's say right now I ask you to actually go to Bursa Malaysia, download an annual report, and then you kind of like know how to read the income statement, balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. And you guys can actually tell me from that statement, this is a good company, why is that so? Or this is a bad company, why is that so? If you have that sort of skill, maybe you can type in one. But if you don't, but if let's say today you are one of those people who, who kind of like say, ah, yeah, uh, accounting, uh, uh, a lot of numbers, leh. it's like very complicated, not to show sure what, what it all means. Don't worry, just be, on, just be honest because investing is a lot of soul searching, a lot of reflective work, especially on ourselves. If you don't have the skill, just put in zero, okay? If you are well worse, just put in one, okay? Just want to see who just want to see what is actually your your take on this. So we have 
Kamaruddin, so who says negative one, Farid one, Siti one, Donald zero, uh, SH Toh zero, Wong Kok Leong zero, Gumal Singh zero, so I see a lot of zeros. Okay, Huang says 0 0.5, maybe because you're halfway learning and that's really good. Ng Sek Hock, Ng Seng Hock, you should be one. Okay, you have been with me for quite some time. You should be one. Patrick Fu, one. Okay, so thank you so much for your feedback. So guys, if you are under zero, thank you so much for your honesty. Accounting skills would be your, would be your next homework as to you need to actually have this skill. All right? So important because if you, are, if you want to build something which is more sustainable, you need to have an accounting skill. You need to pick up this skill. This is actually the most important skill when it comes to investing. If you know this skill, you can actually identify good stocks and then you can dismiss and discard all the bad stocks that are not even worth our time, our effort, our capital. We don't need to actually put our money there because it's just wastage. Okay, Accounting skills will allow us to reduce that sort of wastage and uh, by reducing that sort of wastage, we will actually have lesser chances of uh, getting, uh, will be, we'll have lesser chances of making all sorts of investing mistakes that cost a lot of money. And uh, with accounting skills, we will actually just focus on the good companies, the ones that have very strong balance sheet, very good PL, very good cash flow. And by focusing on these kind of stocks, you will actually have a much uh, better quality stocks in your portfolio. That's how you actually can build a sustainable portfolio and thus contributing to your personal wealth. So accounting skills, very important. So that's skill number one. Skill number two is actually valuation because a lot of times we have a lot of good companies in, especially in Malaysia, all right? In Basal Malaysia, we have a lot of good companies or they are publicly listed, but the question is what kind of valuation? Okay, so guys, so valuation simply means to say um, whether or not this deal, this this good stock, only good stock, uh, only good stock can be valued. Bad stocks cannot be valued. Good stocks, um, sometimes they may be overvalued. Sometimes they may be undervalued. So how do we actually look at them? We need valuation skills. Skills like how do we actually uh, look into their, how do we actually calculate their PE ratio, PEG ratio? dividend yields or PB ratio. So guys, put in the chat box. If you know how to calculate all this kind of stuff, just put in two, all right? If let's say today you are not too familiar with uh, PE ratio, PB ratio, dividend yields and all this kind of stuff, put in zero. Of course, Ng Seng Hock, right? You definitely must be two. So if you have, if let's say today, PE ratio, PB ratio, dividend yields doesn't make any sense to you, put in zero. All right, let's see from the audience. Wong Kok Leong, zero. CS Huang, two. Very good. Okay, Alan, Peter Diman, zero. Okay, very good. Leonard Chua, 1.85. Means to say you are halfway learning. That is actually very good. Patrick Fu, two. Of course, for those of you who have one, you should have two. Okay, that's actually quite normal. For those of you who have zero, it's also very normal for you to actually have zero in your portfolio and in your skill set. Okay, so thank you so much for your response. The third skill that we need to actually that we need to actually uh, pick up after the first two skills. So first skill is accounting, which is the ability to identify good companies, all right, by looking through their financial statements. That's very important. That's number one. Number two is about valuation. Valuation is about making sure that you don't overpay for any stock. Uh, the third skill will be portfolio management. Now, portfolio management simply means to say, let's say you have a portfolio of 10 stocks or 20 stocks. From there, you know how to do spring cleaning. That means you say, you know, you know that, okay, some of the things that, you are, that is working well with you, some of the things that are, it's not working well with you, you know how to turn losers into winners. You know how to actually do portfolio all allocation so that um, your portfolio is kind of like, it's actually quite focused towards building your wealth, but at the same time, very much diversified. So that one is actually portfolio management skills. It's an art form by itself, okay? So that one is actually skill number three. 
Okay. So these are the three skills that you need to pick up when it comes to uh, when it comes to stock investing. Now, once you have done skill number two, then level number two, which is acquiring the three skill sets. The third one will be prototype. Prototype simply, simply means this. Let's say you want to build a six-figure portfolio. You don't need to actually straight away use 100K and build a six-figure portfolio straight away. We don't do that. Usually, a lot of things, right, we actually build it from, we build it from little, uh, from a little portfolio and slowly we grow. As our experience grow, as our capital grow, then we will grow the portfolio um, over time. So prototype simply means to say, let's say you envision yourself to build yourself a $100,000 portfolio. But instead of building $100,000, maybe you start out with $20,000 just to see that whether or not you are successful in managing $20,000. So if you know, so if you are very good with $20,000, then you can actually move up to thirty dollars or 40000 But if you are not too good with $20,000, then you may actually want to optimize your portfolio. You want to know what is working and what is not working. And then what is not working, you don't try to repeat. What is, work, what is working, then you keep on, repeat, keep on repeating it because it's actually working, all right? So that's called optimization. So that is actually where you are at. If, you are, if let's say you now have a portfolio, then you can actually focus on optimization. And last but not least, once you have done optimizing your portfolio, you know what's working and what's not working, Level four is actually about expansion and diversification. Expansion simply means you can actually grow your portfolio to six figures, to the to not just one hundred thousand to two hundred thousand, half a million, and close to one million dollars. That's expansion. Diversification is like this: it's like you don't actually dump everything into one stock, or do, no matter how confident you are about that stock. Okay, it doesn't work that way. Okay, some may argue that oh, I have one million dollar in portfolio, but then. $600,000 or $700,000 of that portfolio is only on one single stock. Uh, does it work? To some, it may, but usually it doesn't work that way. So you need to actually know how to diversify your portfolio in a way that, um, in a way that uh, if let's say that is, because things may happen. If let's say certain things happen to that one stock, then at least you limit, at least to say your capital losses from that one stock is actually limited. So that is diversification. Now let's go into part number three, whereby I have already reviewed to you level one, two, three, four. So now what are the action steps that could actually get you to, to the next level? All right, so this will be part number three. Okay, so now let's say just now, a lot of you guys actually put in zero in the, in the chat box. That will be actually very good, very helpful to you to know that the, you are at level zero, that's perfectly okay. Because when it comes to investing, right, everyone starts with zero, one, including myself. Everyone starts with zero, okay? But instead of using money to go, use, instead of starting with money and go into the stock market, open a, like, I have money, open, open an account, a stock brokerage account, and start buying stocks just like that. I start off with, right, with having a right mindset. After you have the right mindset, the next step is to actually acquire some skills, skills like accounting. So if you're at zero, the mindset must be right, right? Okay. And the next step for you is instead of investing your money, it's time for you to up-level your skills, all right, when it comes to investing. So if you are at level zero right now, which means to say you are a new, totally new to the stock market, memang kertas kosong completely nothing blank piece of paper no stock brokerage account no portfolio if let's say today you are at that level then here is actually uh the way that i took but you can follow lah, all right the way that i took when it comes to uh moving on from level zero or level one to level two so the road that i took is this i I, I read this book, which is Buffettology. Okay. So guys, if you have a copy of this book, very good. It's like the Bible. It's like, it's like the Bible of value investing. So every value investor should actually be reading this book, Buffettology. Okay. So if you don't have a copy, 
go online, buy one of these copies, buy a copy of this book. All right. It's written by Mary Buffett and it's a very, very good book. It's a starting book, but it's a very well written book that uh, people should that people should be reading when it comes to starting their journey as a stock investor. So read Buffettology. Okay. That's the next. In fact, you can say that this, in, this small little investment into this book, right, is actually gonna is actually one of the best investments lah, that investors should be making lah, when it comes to starting their portfolio. Okay, so read Buffettology. And after you read Buffettology, then you may want to get this small little book, which is which is titled Warren Buffett and the Interpretation of Financial Statements. Okay, so read this book, uh, these two books, both by Warren Buffett. Okay, uh, very good books. So this will be your next homework. Okay, so this will actually deal with the mindset and this will actually do a little bit part of the, at least it gives you an introduction to accounting. Okay, which is skill set number one. So you, so which means you say your next homework, if you are, if you, if you just now you type in zero, right? Read Buffettology and Warren Buffett and the interpretation of financial statements. Okay, so that will be your level. Okay, so this is actually so the mindset you should be clear that stock investing is actually about accumulation of good businesses. And once you actually got that down in your mindset, the next step is to actually enhance your skills when it comes to accounting first. If let's say these three skills you don't have, start with accounting. Don't take out three skills at one time. Start with accounting, followed by valuation, then only portfolio management. Okay, let me repeat this again because it's quite important. Start with accounting first, then follow by valuation. Then the third one is portfolio management. This is actually the homework that you will need to do if you are a complete newbie. All right, start with this. Okay, next. Now, let's say for example, you are in level negative. So what is level negative? Level negative, I believe, I coin it level negative simply because there are people who have years of experience in stock trading and speculation, which means to say these are people who have a stock brokerage account and they have been trading stocks for the past five years, seven years, 10 years, or even 20 years. Okay, they definitely have years of experience in stock trading and speculation activities but the thing is when you ask them how what is the size of their portfolio uh, usually you will hear a figure which is not meaningful at all okay which means say after 10 years after 20 years of stock trading activities and stock speculation activities is how much do they have in their portfolio nothing much okay which means say they did not actually achieve any sort of meaningful success or any sort of recovering profits from their trading activities, which means to say for the past 10 to 20 years of trading and speculation activities, it's really not working for them. And if you happen to be one of these people, uh, there are a few choices that you need to make. The first one is that, of course, if you are in this level, of course, you can actually keep doing what you, are, what you have been doing. Lah. Uh, if you find this to be entertaining, then of course, uh, you can actually choose to do, keep on doing what you have been doing all this while, as long as you are happy. Okay. But if let's say today you are thinking that all these years of trading and speculating activities does not bring you any meaningful wealth, then you may want to reconsider your methods versus the investment philosophies of successful investors. People like Warren Buffett, people like Charlie Munger. Okay. What is your philosophy versus what is what are their philosophies? You may want to actually bonding. What per bonding? You may want to actually compare and see whether or not theirs are better or is it yours are better. Okay. If they are, if let's say theirs are better, then of course you may want to actually you may want to actually adopt their philosophies. So that is actually a choice that uh, I believe. If you're in this level, you should be making, you should be actually making this kind of uh, choices. 
either to stick to what you have been doing or you may want to actually revamp. You may actually want to relearn. You may want to empty out what you have been doing all along and you may want to replace it with something that is actually more sustainable. Okay. So if you are under level negative, then you may actually want to join the level zero when you're all around to go through level one and level two, which is to, to make sure that uh, you actually acquire the right mindset, which is business-like investing, and also the three skills as shown on the screen, accounting, valuation, and portfolio management. All right. So this is actually for level zero and level negative. Now, okay, just now there are people who actually type in one and two when I ask them about, uh, when I ask you guys about how many of you have accounting skills, how many of you are good in valuation. So when you're in this level, right? Okay, that means to say you could be in level three. I don't know, but you could be la, in level three. Okay, level three are for people who have a stock portfolio. That means to say uh, prior to this webinar session, you already have a stock portfolio. And maybe at this stage, right, your stock portfolio may, it could be smaller, like around 50K. Like right now you have a five-figure portfolio, which is okay, doing well. All right. But you're thinking how you actually can move into the six-figure level. That is actually very good. Now, let me just, let me also just put a caveat here. So this 50K, right, it's not just about the size. It's also about how you build this portfolio that matters. It's not about the size of your portfolio. It's about how, what are the methods that you use to actually build a portfolio. So let me just give you an example. For example, if this is actually a trading portfolio, then that's not what I mean. But if this $50,000 portfolio, it can be also a even smaller, port smaller portfolio, like 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. So whatever figure that you put in, that you currently have right now in your portfolio, if you build it based on this, methods like for example you have been investing in good companies you have been looking at the fundamentals of the company and because of the because of the fundamentals because of the business model the management team the financial results all very good and the valuation is actually pretty good you buy them you invest in them and that is actually the method that you use to build your 20,000 30,000 40,000 or 50,000 dollar portfolio now that one counts now that qualifies you to be level three. Also, at this stage, right, you should be receiving some form of dividends, especially if you're investing in Malaysia. You should actually, you should actually generate some form of uh, dividend income, either on a quarterly basis or on a half yearly basis. Every three to six months, you must actually have some form of dividends if you have that size of portfolio. If not, something is actually very wrong, okay? Um, to your portfolio. It doesn't matter that uh, the, the dividend is a lot, the dividend yields are high or low, but you must actually receive some dividends. If, you are dip, if, you, if the amount of dividends you receive is zero, then something is very wrong with your portfolio. But if you have been receiving the dividends, then you're level three. And uh, this one is actually, the next one would be this. When you have that portfolio, it's actually quite normal for you to experience either some capital gains or capital losses very normal okay very normal if you have actually have let's say for example you have a portfolio of fifty thousand ringgit and then it is actually and then inside your portfolio you have about eight to ten stocks maybe four maybe uh, out of that eight let's say ten stocks maybe three of them have capital gains four of them they just move sideways and then there's three where there are three more stocks which are incurring capital losses. Fine. Okay. At this stage, you may want to learn how to optimize your portfolio. Okay. So this is where portfolio management comes in. Your next homework is to actually uh, assess what has been working for you, what has not been working for you, what has not been working for you, you switch those that are not working for you you recoup back the capital and put and put it into something that is actually working for you. So that will be your homework. It is actually more about spring cleaning your own portfolio. Now, when I say spring cleaning, it doesn't mean that when you buy a stock, it is actually incurring a capital loss. It doesn't mean that you make a bad mistake. It doesn't mean that you make a mistake because I also make 
very good decision. I also make, I also have capital losses in my portfolio, but it's not like I make a mistake. It's just that at that after I after I purchase a stock, the stock price came down. It's of better value. It could mean that way. All right. So the next step is to determine for stocks that have actually incurred capital losses, are they really a mistake or are they just uh, stocks that are really good but of good value or better value than you bought it some time ago? So you may want to actually determine which of the two scenarios is that. And uh, if it's a mistake, then of course you sell. If let's say if it's not a mistake, but it's of good value that you may want to actually hold or keep it or you want to actually add more position into it. Okay, so this is actually stuff that you may want to learn in order to spring clean your portfolio. Okay, and once you have done that successfully, the next one is this. Once you have actually spring clean your portfolio, then of course you can actually think about expanding your portfolio and diversifying it. Okay, so if you're in level three, learn what's working and what's not for your portfolio. You may want to rechannel your capital from mistakes to something that's working for you. At this stage, when you have $50,000, uh, it is actually quite pertinent for you to actually keep on learning from someone who is actually off, uh, who is actually more, who has actually gone ahead of you. All right. So let's say, for example, you are at 50000 you are thinking of, how do you actually build a hundred thousand dollar portfolio? Then you may want to actually surround yourself with people who actually build that, and then learn from them. Okay, so like like for example, for myself, I have six figures. Then I may want to actually learn from someone who is who has actually built a seven figure or eight figure portfolio. I just want to learn their insights, and then uh, if I find them useful, then I will actually learn it and apply it for my own portfolio. Okay. And of course, learn about portfolio allocation, expansion, and diversification. Now, part number four, tipping points for each level of investing. How do you know that you have graduated from each level of investing? Okay, so this is actually very important. So here are the four levels of invest here are the four levels of investing. So first, for those of you who actually type in zero, okay, so now you start off with level one, which is the mindset. So once you actually know that you firmly believe and you, are, and you have the conviction that stock investing is not about quick money, stock investing is not so much about fast money, it's not so much about buying low and sell high at the quick, and uh, profit from it from the, at the quickest possible amount of time. Rather, it is actually a very long-term game it is long-term, not short-term. It is business-like investing, not trading and speculation. Congratulations, you graduated from level one. And then you can move on to level two, which is the skill sets. At, skill, at level two, once you know how to differentiate good companies from bad companies using a financial statement, once you know how to, from a pool of stocks, identify stocks that are undervalued, fairly valued, and overvalued, and you know how to build a watch list, okay? Once you know how to do all this kind of stuff, then you are considered a graduate of level two. Then you move on to level three. So once you have the, so once you have the, Actually, level one and level two, you can consider this as theory. Level three is more like practical. It's more like, okay, I learned the theory. Now it's time for me to practice what I have actually learned. It's time for application. So that's why you don't actually go in all at once. You just build a small little prototype portfolio just to make sure that uh, your methods, your system, the structure is actually working when it comes to building your portfolio. From there, you will actually experience some small successes, like you kind of like receive dividend income, you have some capital gains and losses and all this kind of stuff. So, so this at, at this phase, right, um, once you actually gather some level of small successes, once you kind of like know 
what is actually working for you, what is working best for you, and what is not really working for you, and you know how to optim optimize your portfolio, then I would say that you kind of like graduated from, le from level three. And last but not least, at level four, level four is when you know that you kind of like graduated from level four. It is a time where you know how to deal with market downturns. You know how to deal with investment mistakes. You know how to turn your losses into winners. That's when you know you have graduated from level four. Because a lot of times, markets doesn't go the way that we want, to, we want it to go. Sometimes there's COVID-19. Sometimes there's, there's some economic crisis. There is like, uh, I do not know. There could be terrorist attacks. There could be... All kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff. Lah. After COVID-19, right, I have learned that the market, right, anything can happen. Anything and everything could have happened, can happen. So when it happens, what do you do? If you have a plan to actually deal with this kind of thing, congratulations. You have actually reached level four. All right. So level four is actually a state where you kind of like know how to react, know what you should be doing as a as an investor to manage your portfolio, especially during crisis times, downturns, market recessions, good. If you know how to do that, consider yourself a graduate of level four. Now we are going into part number five, whereby I'm going to share, I'm going to just share with you why is it that investing right uh, is a lot easier when your stock portfolio hits 100 grand and above. Okay. So just now, a lot of people, I mean to say, some of you guys, I have reviewed that uh, this slide over here. It seems that the process from here to here, right, it seems a long, it seems to be quite long, lah, right? Because you have to learn about accounting, valuation, portfolio management, build a small little portfolio, test out your system, and then uh, you optimize, you kind of like learn and gain experience before you can actually finally expand and fly right of course this process all in all it should take around two years plus minus depending how fast you how fast you can actually learn all right give yourself two years because uh once you actually got the two years experience it can serve you for 40 years 50 years even 60 years down the road all right it's a lifelong skill once you the first two years is a learning stage. Once you get through the learning stage, 40 years down the road is a bliss. All right. You don't really need, you don't really need to actually rely on social media, trusted friends, family members. You don't need them. Because once you have the skill sets, right, they can serve you for life. And you don't really need. Other people, judge. you don't really need other people to advise you on what stock to buy, when to buy, and whatnot, because you have the skills already. When you have the skills, you can do it on your do it at your own capacity. Do it independently. Do it confidently. Okay, so that is actually what I'm advocating. Why I'm advocating. That's why we have this webinar session. That's why we have this education education webinar like this so that you guys can actually have the skill sets to actually build your own portfolio. All right. Now, why is it easier? Think of it this way. Learning how to invest is like learning how to drive. Okay, I'm sure that if you are listening to this webinar, most of you guys know how to drive. So let me just give you an analogy of learning how to drive. Okay. And you can compare this with learning how to invest. So we have again four phases. One, two, three, four. So phase one is where you build your prototype portfolio. You start off with nothing, no account, kertas kosong, and then you start to build yourself a small little portfolio, a prototype portfolio worth about 20 to 25,000 ringgit. Over here, it's not so much about if I invest in this stock, how much am I going to make? What are my returns? And all this kind of stuff. All right. At this stage, I would, I would probably say that uh, it is actually best for you to just learn, gain experience, 
just aim for small successes, but the more important thing, the priority is actually to learn. Because at this stage, it's likened to one who has actually received an L license. So it's kind of like you getting your L license. So when you got your L license, right, don't try to take your... Uh, I remember that when I had my L license, I don't have a car, but I have an L license. The thing is that will I take my father's car and drive to Thailand? The answer is no, all right? So when you have your L license, what do you do? You kind of like just learn how to drive. Maybe you should just practice learning how to drive in your own neighborhood, in your own taman, your neighborhood. Just learn how to park. Just learn how to, uh, how to use the steering wheel, pedaling, use the handbrake and whatnot, okay? So if you are under phase one, just chill and just start with your own taman. Phase two is where your portfolio starts to grow and it will hit 25 to 50K. At this stage, no longer your L license kind of driver, but you actually got a P license. So when you got a P license, of course you don't just drive in your own taman or in your own neighborhood. Now with a P license, of course, you can actually expand your horizon a little, a little bit. Go beyond your taman, go beyond your neighborhood and just start driving in the town or in your city. Okay, so that is phase number two. Phase number three is where your portfolio has hit 50K and now you're moving towards 100 grand. In this case, it's all about experience already. Okay, bear in mind that the first two phase from zero to 50K, I would say that from zero to 25K, this is actually where driving, you need a lot of, uh, men. you need to focus. You need to be like automatically focused. Like, oh, I need to fasten my safety belt. Oh, I need to adjust my mirror. Oh, I need to check this. Oh, I need to check that. I need to adjust my seat. Everything seems to be, not so natural. Everything seems to be very mechanical because you just started to learn. All right, that's why it's called L license, ma. So this is actually where it's the most difficult. Here is easier than L license because you kind of like get the hang of driving already. You kind of like, you don't really need to remind yourself, I need to put on the safety belt. I need to start the, start the engine. I need to check this or check that. You kind of like, now it's becoming more natural, more uh, fluid already when it comes to P license. Phase three is actually about getting new experiences. Ah, now this is actually where things get very exciting. Once your P license is off, that means no longer your P license, now you are like the normal driver on the Malaysian road. It's time for you to gather some driving experiences. No longer you can now it's not just about driving um, in your own town or in your own city. Now you can start to take your car and go for a spin. So if you live in the Klang Valley, you can start driving to Genting Highlands already. Ah, so something like that. You can actually start driving on hilly roads. You can start driving on the North-South Highway. You can drive. You can go in interstate traveling and all this kind of stuff to gain experiences. What is it like? All right. So that is actually phase three, which is more exciting than phase two. It's easier. It's easier over here than here and then here. And last but not least, phase number four is when you hit 100 grand and above. At this stage, right, you have more than three years of driving experiences. At this stage, you just drive. Lah, all right? It's like, <laughs> it's like uh, you take your car keys and just go for a drive. Lah. There's, no one is going to, no one is going to like, yeah. it's not like, it's, it's driving, la. it's like normal. La. It's, 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 you don't really need a driving instructor to sit beside you to actually tell you, fasten your safety belt, adjust the mirror here. Where's your spotlight? Uh, I mean to say, where's your signal light? Did you actually give signal or not? And all this kind of stuff. All right. At this stage, you just drive because driving is now second nature to you. That's why when you hit this stage, it's actually easier. Is the easiest of all stage. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I guess right now it's time for me to pass back the control to Shane, my friend over here, to moderate the Q&A. If you have any, put in the Q&A box. Thanks.
thank you so much, Ian, for doing this segment for us. Right now, I guess many of you have already learned how uh, Ian's use this approach to build a six-figure portfolio. So if you have any questions to ask Ian, please write them at the Q&A box. Mm. All right. So the first question is from Maslan. Ian, what are your thoughts that someone is suggesting that dividends should be taxed? Can they do that after we are already taxed and has taken the risk by investing in it? Yeah, I also agree with that. <laughs> I mean to say, I also agree. I also agree with that. Of course, some countries like US, um, they have corporate tax. After that, they pay out the dividends. Then the, then the dividends are subjected to another, another tax. So the thing is that the beautiful thing about investing in uh, in Malaysia, under Bursa Malaysia, is that it's a single tier tax system whereby after the corporate tax, whatever profits there are, whatever profits that the company make after tax, pay out to shareholders in the form of dividends are not taxed. That's a very beautiful thing in Malaysia, and I hope that um, that someone don't uh, suggest this. I mean to say, so I'm a dividend investor. So the thing is that uh, I hope not uh, I hope that it won't materialize. Mm, yeah, I think if this is implemented, it will take a toll in the capital market. There will be more uh, outflow of funds from the capital market. <laughs> the next question is by Stephen. To be in level 3 or 4 or 5, it is much easier if you invest in the US stocks as many have global businesses, big and have strong modes like Apple, Microsoft, Nike, Visa, Google, etc. So within 5 to 10 years, the probability of profitable is very high as compared to investing in the uh, 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 Bursa Malaysia blue chip stocks. What is your view on this? I wish I can say yes, lah, but this is actually a more this is actually the uh, a, a session by Bursa Malaysia, right? So it will be it will be more, how would I say? It will be uh better if I if it would be better if we just uh, stick our conversation to Bursa Malaysia. Lah. But if let's say you're talking about investors' point of view, I guess these days we are living in a borderless world whereby, um, whereby, it's not, whereby capital, whereby investments is not just limited to Bursa Malaysia, right? So I guess, um, Stephen, I mean to say, yeah, you can say that um, your views are actually quite spot on in, the, in that sense, okay? Your, your views are actually quite spot on in the sense that, uh, yeah, sure, of course, you can actually go into Singapore or US. You can actually explore around. And that's also the beauty of investment, especially stock investing, right? Because you have ample of choices, not just in Bursa, Malaysia, but in elsewhere. But of course, with that said, right, um, if, you want, if you want a newbie, okay, it depends on your financial si situation also, lah. Let's say, for example, you always have an influx of cash coming in, like maybe you are making about maybe five figures kind of income or not just $10,000 a month, but $20,000, $30,000 a month. Then, of course, uh, US stocks will be more, much more affordable to you. Then, of course, you can actually, uh, without me saying, of course, you can actually, anyone can actually just, uh, just uh, explore that option uh, of investing. But what if, let's say, today you are looking at someone who is actually uh, starting to build a portfolio and then you just want to start with something which is more familiar, something which is more affordable because personal Malaysia stocks are not... Affordability and valuation is two different things, huh? all right? Affordability means to say, okay, the stock is one ringgit, so it's more affordable for you to invest. Doesn't mean that one ringgit for that stock is actually... Uh, undervalued it's not that it's not like that okay let me give you an analogy huh? so let's say we have a Bursa Malaysia stock price at one ringgit and a US stock that is priced at 100 US dollar of course the one ringgit is more affordable but in terms of valuation it can be very different okay doesn't necessarily mean that the 100 USD kind of stock is more is definitely more expensive than the one ringgit one. So that one actually revolves around how, how well versed you are when it comes to skill set number two, which is valuation. All right? Because the 100 USD stock 
can be either undervalued or overvalued as compared to the one ringgit Malaysia stock. So it all depends on how well versed you are in, in uh, calculating that sort of stuff. Okay. But of course, if you have more capital, you can actually uh, feel free to actually build a much more, how would I say, a diversified portfolio that consists of Malaysia and US stocks. You can do that. But if you are starting afresh from something totally kertas kosong, uh, you just have that, you just have that few thousand dollars to build a portfolio, then I would say that Bursa Malaysia is a, is a much better market, much more suitable market for you to actually start off with. Mm, all right. Thank you so much, Ian. Mm. I think if you are new, just uh, I think co just consider investing in Bursa Malaysia first. When as when you get more experience, then of course you can learn how to go abroad. Lah. Mm. All right. Uh, the next question is by Kelvin Chow. Mm. You know, there are a lot of uh, uh, news that the US might go into recession next year considering that we are already in the um, inverted yield curve pattern. So the question from Kelvin is, what do you think of this situation? Do you, how likely will this happen next year? Okay, so I'm going to go all the way back here. So you see, this is now back to what most people do, right? Which is not what savvy investors do. So the thing is that uh, recession, right? So recession... So there are news. So there are news that US might go into recession. There are news. So it's here, lo, news. Lo. So this is actually, so this is actually where most people actually focus on, lo, which is on the news. The news will impact the decision as to whether or not they should be investing in the stock market or whether they should not be investing in the stock market and what stock they may actually go into if they want to invest in the stock market. Okay. But the thing is that for CV investors, we don't actually look into the news, all right? Uh, we do not know because we do not predict the market. I do not know how to predict the market, okay? Like for example, right now, uh, the Fed rates are at the much higher level, 4 or 5%. Couldn't remember, but it has been increasing over the past one or two years, or at least for the past 12 months. Could I foresee that happening? The answer is no, because I'm not the Fed, and more important, I'm just a, uh, I'm just a local investor in Malaysia. I, I do not know how to predict all this kind of stuff. Okay, and for me, predicting is actually not my job as an investor. So I don't actually change my portfolio based on news, based on what might happen in the future because investing is not so much about predicting what might happen to the markets in the future. Okay. For me, I just keep it very simple because I know that the markets, right, anything can happen. So which means to say recession may happen. No recession, maybe a period of good times will, will happen. Maybe a period of recession may happen. So in both situation, my question, my question is, are the stocks in my portfolio, are they financially strong enough to go through good times and bad times? If they are, very good. Okay, that's number one. Number two is that if really there's a recession, usually in, in times of recession, most people, okay, so this is actually where most people, this is most people, they will leave the stock market. They say, oh, times are bad. Time to get out of the stock market. So when that happens, right, a lot of good stocks become undervalued. That is when investors like me will come in and start to actually buy up some really good stocks at the undervalued prices. Because a lot of people, when it comes to news, they, they buy into the news they get out of the market. For me, I don't necessarily care too much about the news. I may read the news just to know what's going on, but my investment decision is not based on the news, but it's actually based on the fundamentals of my stock portfolio. So that is a, 
based on the stock's fundamentals and their valuation. Uh, so that is, that is actually very different, very different approach. And because of that, the style of managing my portfolio will be very different. All right. Thank you so much, Ian, for addressing the question. Now, the next question is by Kok Long. You know, some of us here are not really good at in, count, uh, in accounting or knowing how do we read the company's financial reports. So what option uh, does he have to choose a good company to invest? Oh, without accounting skills, without knowing how to read uh, company's financial report. Actually, this kind of skill is actually quite, quite pertinent. Uh, I mean to say, I understand that uh, some people are some people are better with numbers. Some people are just not really good with numbers. But if, if today you are listening to this and then you happen to be one of those who are not too good with numbers, that's okay. Uh, because everyone just start off with, everyone just, uh, when it comes to maths, everyone starts with one plus one. And accounting is just, I mean to say, it's just plus minus multiplication and division. It's just plus minus times and divide. It's just, this four only, okay? So you just, but then you still need to, you can start off with something which is more simpler, just simpler. Uh, like for example, actually accounting, right? In short, in short, accounting, only seven words to master, seven only. What are the seven words? Income, expenses, profits, Assets, liabilities, equity, cash flow. That's it. Gautim. You know these seven words? You know how to read a company's financial statement. Just master these seven words. Okay? Just that seven words. Income, expense, profit, asset, liability, equity, cash flow. You don't need to read everything. You just start with the first three income, expense, profit. Once you get these three done, asset, liability, equity. Once you get these three also done, then you read the cash flow statement. But can you buy a stock without knowing all these things? That's what most people do. Lah. And most people do. Most people buy stocks without reading financial statements. Ma. That's why sometimes I receive comments like, oh, fund fundamental investing doesn't work in Malaysia. Oh, um, investing is risky. Of course, investing is risky when you don't read financial statements. Because when you don't read financial statements, how would you know? How would you know that the stock is fundamentally good or fundamentally poor? How do you even value the stock without using financial statements? It's very hard to do so. So without reading financial statements, you buy stocks just based on just it's, it's blind or just shoot blindly in the you just then but i mean to say that's that's what most people do but if you happen to be not so good with finances uh just learn the simple just learn the simple thing first and start from there give yourself some more time because if you buy stocks without accounting skills then Better don't lah. Actually, if you don't, but if you happen to find your find it too difficult for you to learn how to do account, how to read all this stuff, right? Then the better way to invest would be to just uh you just put your money in EPF lah. That will be more ideal for that may be more ideal if you are if you are not too good with reading all these financial statement stuff. Yeah, there's always an option. But I will encourage you to actually learn. Take two years, take three years to learn. But that skill, once you got it right, it can serve you for the next 30, 40, 50 years of your life. Mm, all right, or part your money with some uh, unit trust fund or ETF, right? Like the professional managers to manage it for you. Mm -hmm. But if I may add on, if I were to take um to 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 uh uh add on to what I, I think could be useful is that if you really don't know uh how to read financial statements and you don't really have the time to learn, I think the idiot proof way 
uh, which is the low uh, lower uh, lower risk way, is mm. to pick stocks that have consistent profit growth. So long that you know how to identify the company that is growing the profit, like the first year they make twenty million profit, next year they make forty million profit, uh, the next year they make sixty million profit. Uh, then if you know how to read profit, uh, if you see that profit keep increasing, that shows that this company is quite consistent in growing their profit, and then that would be a low risk, uh, lower risk company for you to put your money in. Uh. If you don't really want to learn about accounting, just pick companies that have a consistent profit growth, and that would be uh, one way to lower your risk in investing in the stock market. What do you make of this, Ian? Well, by that, right, you see, in order, that, that's a sim that seems to be very simple, right? Just go back and look at the profit, right? But just now I mentioned the seven words, right? The seven words of accounting, right? Income, expense, profit, right? That's the third word, right? So you still go back to an accounting term, which is profit law. So uh, I mean to say, uh, but there is, I also recognize there may be some mental blockage, like, oh, you, a lot of numbers. Then suddenly you, dis suddenly like, ah, yeah, it seems to be very difficult. Uh, not quite lah. So I, the first step is to actually get rid of this mental blockage. Start with something which is simpler lah. Simpler, yeah. I mean to say, just start with the simple stuff lah. I mean to say, uh, even you, even like for example, the simplest way to start learning how to uh, how to read a financial statement, right? You can go by which that poor that book ah. That will be the easiest way to actually start learning what is a financial statement. Lah. Just the first book, which that project will do. Lah. All right. Then, ah. Thank you so much, Ian. The next question by Chan is that uh, in reference to your slide on level one, level two, and the portfolio size, right? Uh, do you mean that in every phase, like level one, level two, the, the, the figure you put there is the recommended amount that we should keep in the portfolio size like like I, if i'm in level 3 i should put you know up to uh, 70 uh, 100000 is that what you mean or is this an example i would say it's not of i mean to say maybe to you is an example but to me it's more like i because when i prepare this slide i actually kind of like reflect back my own journey lah. so the thing is that beyond the figures because it's not just exactly on the dot 25,000, yay, I graduated. It's not like that. It's more like a reflection of the mindset or the journey at that time. What was I thinking when I, when, when, when I hit that $20,000, $30,000 level versus when I hit phase four, above 100, 100 grand, what is actually, uh, it's just two different sets of Ian, two different versions of Ian. Because me, when I was in, when I have 20 to 30K, my mindset, the skill set, the mastery of the skills, the experience that I've gotten is so much different when I, when I hit here. Here, my skills are more enhanced. All right. My ideas, it's not just ideas, it's more, now it's more sharpened. The acumen is better. I make better decisions. Uh, the experiences that I've gathered are more helpful at this stage. In fact, as a matter of fact, here, of course, from here to here, I do make some mistakes along the way. All right. So what I can say from someone who is here is that at this stage, right, it's more about learning and just gathering of experiences. You would definitely... I mean to say, no one wants to make a mistake, but then mistakes are about to happen lah at this stage. So the thing is that over here, it's very important to keep an attitude of learning. Lah. The returns will come, but mostly at phase four and above. Phase four, you will see bigger returns already because you're more experienced, you're more skilled as an investor at this stage. All right. So the next question is by Lim. So what should be the approach if you want to build a seven-figure portfolio? Seven-figure portfolio, of course, you must ask Shane. Lah, but then <laughs> you must ask Shane. No? <laughs> but I don't have my... That's why, that's why my title of the portfolio is six-figure. But I guess... Okay. I, 
<laughs> but do you have <laughs> Okay, let me put it in my next webinar, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You should be putting it in your next webinar, lah. How to build a six feet. But I guess in Malaysia, I do not know, lah. Uh, I, I do not know of anyone. I do not know yet, lah. Are there anyone who actually don't buy property, don't buy real estate, they just work either through their employment or through their business and then they save, then they just buy stocks on it. They never really consider about property investment. Then if, I, yeah, I have met people who are like this. Maybe these are people who actually hit six or seven figures. but. Uh, I would say that uh, for myself, my journey is where uh, the thing is that my growth in terms of my portfolio got stunted a little bit. Lah. Got stunted somewhere along the line because I took out some funds lah, to buy real estate. So that actually slowed down the process a bit. Lah. But the thing is that uh, seven figure right, is and really, really another level. So like me, I'm still with Casey. KC has definitely have a seven figure portfolio. So I'm still learning from him. And that guy, my boss, KC, is still learning from someone who is actually managing an eight, eight or nine figure portfolio. So the thing is that everyone is actually learning. So, so that is actually the common trait among all of us. The six will learn from the seven, the seven will learn from the eight, the eight will definitely learn from the nine. That kind of stuff. Mm. Hmm. Right. Thanks, Ian, for sharing the perspective. The next question is by Kok Long. Uh, do you think knowing PE ratio, earnings per share, price to book value ratio, uh, TTM compound and a growth rate, enough, good enough to evaluate a company performance, or do we need to learn more than that? Uh, of course, we need to learn more than that, lah. I mean to say, first and foremost, it's not about the PE or EPS. It's about the business model. Uh, that is actually the most important thing because we want to know the source of the the source of the revenue, the source of the profit, because that is actually and the sustainability of this business model. That is actually the most important. Different be different stocks will be in different stocks involved in different industries and thus in different businesses. And therefore it's actually very different. So it's a, so it's all on a case by case basis. Sure, the EPS, the P the PE, the EPS, the PB, all this kind of stuff will come in, but at a at the level stage after we have understand the business model. So we need to actually study that first. Then only we talk about, then we only talk about the financial stuff that you actually talk about, which is the actually EPS is actually accounting. Valuation is PE and PB. Yeah. Then we talk about that at the latter stage. Correct. All right. Uh, the next question is by Chin. Um, what is your view that if someone is on level one, mm -hmm. but he inver inherited a very good stocks, even though he's in level one, uh, what is your view? Oh, um, the thing is that... Uh, So it's like he inherited money, but he has no mindset, no mindset, no skills, no real experiences, right? Then uh, also not too good. Lah. I mean to say that guy will have to learn and mature faster than anyone else. Lah. Yeah. So it, so it can, I do not know whether is it a blessing or it can be a curse, but uh, the thing is that, um, yeah, so the thing is that if you have too much, if you happen to inherit a portfolio or inherited money like $1 million and uh, your financial brain or the level is not $1 million, then it can be a little bit of a headache also. Lah. Then it really depends on the character of the person, no? whether or not he can hold that $1 million. It's not about it's not about one million dollars. It's about whether he he has the brain, he has the he has the knowledge, he has the insights to actually manage that kind of portfolio, lah. But if he doesn't, then uh, either he will lose it, or if he could actually learn 
quickly and mature quickly, quickly enough, then I guess he can, he will be able to hold onto that portfolio, hold onto the cash, hold onto the wealth. And beyond that, of course, he can actually make it grow. But he has to learn and grow quickly. Hmm. All right. So it looks like we have uh, run out of time for us to uh, do any more uh, questions from the floor. So uh, I will just take it over, Ian, mm. if you are okay. Yes. Sure. All right. So let me just uh, do the screen sharing. So ladies and gentlemen, you just heard from the co-founder of Dividend Vault and the content producer of kclaw.com, Mr. Ian Tai. Thank you so much, Ian, for sharing with us on this topic. How do we build a portfolio to, uh, of six figure from scratch?